Good afternoon. I'm Kevin Wright, your host and executive director of the Atwood Museum. Before we start on this evening's uh, lecture, uh, a few uh, housekeeping items. Uh, the Atwood Museum officially opens to the public on Friday, May 7th from 10 to 4. Reservations are required, so please check our website for specific times. We will be open on Fridays and Saturdays through the month of May, and then our normal summer schedule will start on Tuesday, June 1st. Our goal is to create a safe environment for our staff, volunteers, and visitors. We are thrilled that several people are getting their vaccines, but please be aware that we will still be requiring masks while visiting the Atwood Museum. This year, we are very excited to collaborate with the Cape Cod Museum Trail for Museum Mondays. Visitors will have an opportunity to enjoy different museums across Cape Cod every Monday during the month, free of charge. Our free day will be Monday, May 24th, so mark your calendar. And again, reservations are required. Make your plans to join us on Tuesday, May 11th for our next Tuesday talk at the Atwood. Uh, we will welcome Captain Mike Abdow with his lecture, Life of a Charter Fisherman. Two final notes before I introduce our speaker. A lot of work goes into putting these uh, lecture, on these lectures. If you like what you see, please consider making a donation. Your generosity is critical to our success and is very much appreciated. For your convenience, Ellie O'Reilly will add a donation link to the chat and thank you very much. If you have any questions for our speaker this evening, please write them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we will answer as many questions as time allows uh, following this evening's talk. Now allow me to introduce our guest. In 1973, British engineer, Dr. Michael Tomset took the world's first digital photograph using a digital camera of his own invention. Tomsett continued his work on imaging technology at Bell Laboratories for decades and has been awarded the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering and an Emmy Award for Technology and Engineering amongst many other accolades. Now a full-time resident of Chatham, it is my privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Ty Dr. Michael Tomsett. Am I there? There we go. Just need to share your screen, Michael. Oh, well, can you see me? We can see you, yep. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll just say hello. Uh, good evening to everybody. And uh, thank you very much, Kevin, for that introduction and to Don for inviting me and to Ellie for, uh, uh, organizing the uh, technical side of this. Uh, I've given talk, many talks around the world, but I've never given a talk from home. So this is truly a first. Uh, so let's go straight into uh, operations. I will share my screen and with a bit of luck, you will see it. Okay, now does everyone see that? Looks good, Michael. Yeah, okay, good. Um, well, uh, it may be poetry month, but I'm not going to do any poet poetry reading. But equally, uh, you won't get, but relax, you won't get a lot of physics or either. So this will be a low tech talk with lots of emphasis on the personal side of technology evolution and lots of pictures. We all like pictures. So I will be doing some history of television and of course the history that I've participated in. There will be a bit of bragging. My wife says probably too much. And uh, I hope there'll be some interesting stuff that uh, will uh, tickle your fancy. So let's get stuck into some of this uh, good stuff. Uh, today's digital imaging is amazing. We can fit two high resolution digital cameras into a quarter inch thick mobile phone. The manufacturing cost is only a few dollars and we have unbelievable imagery everywhere in space, around the earth, everywhere. And we can see each other on Zoom where we would have been in the last year without uh, 
television imaging? I don't know. So let's just start off with a little bit of uh, imaging history uh, based on photography. Yesterday's silver photography was still pretty amazing. Uh, it was in invented 1837 by Daguerre, whom you see on the right, and another English and an Englishman also uh, independently invented uh, photography using silver. Silver maintained that was retained as the key ingredient in photography. And by the year 2000, which is only 21 years ago, celluloid film using silver had reached incredible resolution and color rendition. This set the bar very high for perfecting electronic images. But the, uh, the designers of electronic images uh, realized fantastic performance and the integrated circuit people made them with incredible perfection. And in 2012, Kodak went bankrupt. Well, in 1900s, after the invention of wireless, visionaries wanted to transmit pictures, i.e. remote vision or television. Fortunately, in 1897, Brown, the German, had invented the cathode ray tube. And that principle of the cathode ray tube was used in all television sets that we've all used up until flat panels arrived in 1998. These tubes scanned a beam of electrons in a vacuum onto a phosphor to produce light. But in 1908, inventors started using that same principle of scanned electron beams in a vacuum tube to convert images into electronic signals. This one is just a, 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 neat, a, a neat historical uh, piece of uh, information. Farnsworth uh, in, invented a camera tube. He conceived the idea of raster scanning at the age of 15. Living in the country, in the Midwest, he saw farmers plowing the fields, going backwards and forwards. He sketched an electronic TV system on the blackboard of his chemistry teacher, you, which implied scanning. His name was Philo Farnsworth, and in 1927, his teacher brought the sketch of, that he put on the blackboard into a patent court, and he received the first patent for the all-electronic TV camera. I won't, go into, well, I won't describe the principles of it. We don't need to do that. The one issue was that it required very bright lights because there was no charge storage. The, each, the, many of the uh, incident light photons, uh, the little increments of light, were lost because uh, there was no storage. A guy called Swarikin at RCA in, in New Jersey invented an iconoscope, which did have storage in it. So silver was now brought back into the picture. Um, and uh, the electrons were stored on the, those silver globules. And this tube, a large bulky tube, was used in TV broadcast for about 10 years, 36 to 46, including the controversial German Olympic Games in 1936. Now, this is an image orthicon tube. This is probably the first real viable camera tube. Um, and this was actually being manufactured when I started working in industry uh, over 60 years ago. So I, I know a little bit about these tubes. They have an amazing target that's produced by blowing bubbles of glass, very, very thin bubbles of glass, just like soap bubbles and collecting them on a ring. And they are used as the target inside this camera tube. This tube is about two feet long and um, is invented RCA, very sensitive. It was nicknamed the IMI tube. It was used for broadcast TV in 1947 to 1967. And I'll come back to that name of IMI at the end of the talk. Uh, 1950, uh, uh, Paul Weimer, whom I knew personally, met him a lot of times at RCA, invented a Vidicon camera tube, but that was too slow for TV. However, in 1963, Dutch Phillips developed what's called the Plumbicon camera tube, in, and that was used in all the TV between 68 and year 2000. Uh, so all of us have seen TV using 
uh, those those plumbicone camera tubes. Now I know a lot about that tube because I happen to work on it to develop it uh, to to help improve the uh, manufacturing capability and performance, etc. So we're now in a period that I'm familiar with. Those tubes were used in very large cameras, not the little phone cameras we have today. But three tubes, three of those image orthogon tubes were used in this enormous great camera. And that's what they trundled around the TV studio. Now we're going to change the topic. That's we're, we're, we're put imaging on hold for the moment, um, visual imaging on hold for the moment. We'll talk a little bit about uncooled thermal imaging. This is an area that, that I invented actually. And uh, the reason I invented it in 1968 was that the, the first thermal imaging camera that was produced by a company in Sweden called Aga was enormous. You can see it's just this enormous, great, great bulky thing. Um, and it was very slow. It was required uh, uh, very low temperatures, liquid nitrogen, minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. It weighed 110 pounds. So it just not, was not a, what I would call a viable device. I wanted, so I thought let's do something that was small would operate at room temperature and at TV rates. And in 1968, I was very fortunate enough to invent the pyroelectric camera tube. And in fact, the whole new field of uncooled thermal imaging. Imaging and infrared, that's red, uh, infra hot heat rays, infrared heat rays, or in a heat pattern onto a pyroelectric material, which I put at the front of a camera tube generated a corresponding pattern of electronic charge. And by introducing a novel electron beam readout system, I was able to read that electronic charge off the, the pyroelectric material. So that led to a pyroelectric camera tube. And the tube received immediate acceptance for firefighting since the camera could see through smoke. A career American firefighter described these cameras as the most fantastic piece of rescue equipment I've seen in 29 years. It has revolutionized firefighting and rescue. You see through the room as though the smoke wasn't there. And that, here, here you can see the, the, cam, the uh, camera with the, uh, this, this pyroelectric Vidicon uh, tube uh, installed inside it in some sort of heat insulating box has a, um, a an IR transparent lens on the front. This camera tube uh, and the camera actually won a Queen's Award in the 1980s. So that was not a personal award that went to the company that which I worked for EEV that uh, developed this camera. Uh, I also invented an integrated thermal imaging uh, approach to, to, uh, to this camera. I, instead of a tube, the idea was to have a chip. And I wrote that into a patent. I really hadn't very much idea how it's going to happen, but I, I patented it. And in 1990, that's 20 years later, uh, Hansen at TI actually developed something that was pretty much my invention. However, another guy at Honeywell developed a much fancier uh, system with a much fancier material, and that really has dominated the business from then on. This picture at the bottom here shows the, the an integrated circuit that's a silicon chip underneath this paddle type structure that's being constructed above it. So your imaging chip would have many thousands, uh, millions maybe, of, of these paddles, which have the, um, the uh, photosensitive material on them and gave to now give today in today's world, give enormous uh, sensitivity. There's a company called Fleur that now sells about $2 billion worth of IR cameras a year. Incidentally, the, F the CEO of Fleur has a house here in Chatham and I have met him. Ah, come here. 
The Chatham Fire Brigade even uses these cameras uh, for firefighting. Uh, here is Joe Bono with one of four thermal imaging cameras uh, used by the, Chatham, by the Chatham Fire Department. They have one per, per uh, fire engine. You can see it's a, it's a pretty small device now, but it does give them an image and they can see through smoke and find people maybe lying unconscious uh, in a burning building. There are other applications of, of uncooled thermal imaging, in particular viewing items with temperature differences. You can see three examples here. One is night vision for surveillance, military use, of course, and also search and rescue. Uh, I checked out the helicopter that landed at the lighthouse uh, several years ago. And there was this uncooled thermal imaging camera embedded in the base of the helicopter, which they used for spotting people, maybe in the sea. Uh, if you have your, if you want a thermal survey of your house to see where the heat's leaking, then uh, the, somebody can come along with an uncooled thermal imaging camera. And there's also a developing field for medical diagnostic thermography. I gave a lecture in London a couple of years ago to uh, a, a group of, uh, what? To a group of thermographers, medical thermographers. Now we're going to move back to thermal imaging. And uh, it's an interesting, it's just an interesting history here. There's a guy, there are two people, Peter Noble in England and Gene Weckler in California, who independently and simultaneously in 1967 invented X-ray, XY addressed imaging arrays. By XY, that means that you have a silicon chip and you can address uh, a, 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 it's like a, a, a rectang rectangular pattern of uh, electrodes that connect to pixels on the array. They invented these, but unfortunately, there was no adequate integrated, sec uh, integrated circuit technology with the performance, the resolution and the yield that uh, they could make these devices with. So these had to be held put on hold for about uh, 20 years. Uh, in the meantime, oh, uh, the, there were two interesting press uh, uh, announcements of, of those devices, of, of, of um, Peter Noble's device in 1967. He gave a talk and one, one press uh, um, article was that this was a TV camera smaller than this headline, which was fairly dramatic. So, but they understood what they were being shown and somebody else wrote a mini camera seen changing TV industry. Not only did it change the TV industry, it changed the world, of course. So they were very prescient comments. But in the meantime, I wanted to work on integrated circuit images. And in 1969, I moved to Bell Labs. Bell Labs had developed the picture phone, which was demonstrated at the World Fair in the 1964, I think it was, 1960s. But, and, but they, they'd shown it off, but they hadn't really developed it to be viable. Uh, in particular, they developed a new camera tube that was used in it, but it degraded extremely rapidly. And unfortunately, they gave that job to me when I first arrived at Bell Labs, when I was itching to do some of this solid state imaging stuff. But anyway, I solved that problem. And then uh, something ha interesting happened uh, in 1969, the charge coupling, uh, the concept of charge coupling was invented by Boyle and Smith at, at Bell Labs. Boyle was my, um, Smith was my, my uh, department head, actually. Uh, the, the principle of this is you take on, on your piece of silicon, you grow an oxide and then, then um, define the electrodes on top of that oxide. And by pulsing these electrodes, you can move packets of charge across the silicon. So it's a way of defining and moving packets of charge. The intent though that, that Smith and Boyle had was that to use it exclusively for memory. Now, 
I made and demonstrated the first charge couple device. It had eight bits or eight pixels. So it was, it was a tiny uh, in comparison to what we know of today, devices that have megapixels on them. But it demonstrated the principle. I could move charge from one end of the device to the other, and we could use it to scan a pretty rudimentary image of the letters CCD. But the important point was that I realized immediately that if all the charge from an imaging area could be moved to a tiny output, that would dramatically improve the performance compared to that of a camera tube. And then, of course, I had to work out a structure that would enable me to read out charge to that small output. And the structure I came up with for, for TV, for area imaging, was what I called frame transfer. And it automatically created the TV line scans. If you look at this diagram, the, the, um, lit area, the yellow area is where the light would be incident. Once you've integrated that for a TV um, uh, uh, frame time, then all that charge is moved rapidly into a lower part of the device. And you go back to integrating in the, in the upper part. Now you can read out the lower part very line by line into a readout register. So this would be step down one line, read out, step down one line, read out. So it really had the same interlace, in fact, it had the same scan structure that a TV had. And in fact, we introduced interlace as well by a clever trick. So it really produced video output that could go directly into a TV. Well, that's another story. We'll get into that in a moment. I, I received the first patent for CCD images as the sole inventor of that device. And I and my group made the first CCDs, images, cameras, et cetera. It was a very heady, heady time for us. Now here is the first, here am I with a beard. Uh, and, and this is the, the first camera. And I'll show, I have this camera here. I will show it to you at the end of the talk. Uh, here is my colleague, um, Ed Zimini who's really the brains behind all this. He put all the circuitry together and made the camera work. And here we are taking a picture. And in fact, the picture we took was that of my wife. And here she is, still as beautiful as ever. And uh, she went on the cover of Electronics Magazine. So she was the first digital cover girl in 1973, a long time ago. Well, we received lots of publicity for our work. Uh, this was a uh, something I think in the New York Times, 19, oh, New Scientists in this case, 1975. By this time, we'd made fairly big chips uh, that were, met the TV standards, 525 lines. Um, and they pointed out this was the world's biggest chip, makes the tiniest TV camera. Um, and it was the biggest chip. I mean, people were not making chips that big at that time. Uh, the CCD imager here is compared with a mag magnetically scanned Vidicon. That is what you, ne you needed to put three of those into a camera to make a color camera. So you can see immediately that we're on the right track for making things smaller. My patent also included linear scanners for use in scanners and also satellites. The beauty of satellites is that they just move slowly oh, across the earth. And uh, if you have uh, CCD lin linear images there, they will pick up the, uh, the picture and uh, do whatever, make Google Maps. This is a picture that we scanned in the lab with a 1500 pixels linear CCD that we made. There was a challenge though. The output of a chip is an analog signal. That is, it can take any, any value. That's like eyesight or uh, uh, speaking, it's any value. And the initial cameras, Sony, for example, made one using a CCD chip, but it used analog memory. Kodak had digital patent, camera patents in 1978 and 89, but did not commercialize them for several years for good reason, I'll show you. And 1997, finally, Sony came out with the first truly digital Mavica camera. 
Well, what am I talking about when I talk about analog and digital? Well, that's illustrated here. This is a schematic of a digital camera showing the analog to digital converter function. The light is incident on from the left hand side through a lens is imaged down onto the the uh, imaging device. There's color filters in there actually on the chip, of course, we're now getting away from having three devices. This is just one. So this is the image sensor and then the analog signal goes into this A to D. From then in today's world, it goes into a digital signal process and they do all sorts of clever things in there before it's displayed on your phone or it's put into memory, etc. So the problem is this analog to digital converter and that had been a big stumbling block because in the 1980s, ADCs still used discrete components and were bulky, used lots of power, and were expensive, especially for video. In 1987, I finally invented an architecture for an integrated video A to D converter. And I'd been trying for about 10 years, and other people around the country were also trying. In, so I, that concept was, in, was designed into a chip, 10 bits, 15 megahertz CMOS chip, by a designer who worked for me, Banks Up Song. And that device went to analog devices and they sold $25 million worth in the first year of production. The industry was really, really needed that device. This is just an example of a very large CCD. I have one, I have it here, I can show you later. Um, the, this, the, uh, this actually was, was um, one that went uh, similar to the one that went on uh, the trip to Mars on the Voyager. Anyway, CCD images started the digital camera industry. Today, they're, uh, they're extensively used for scientific and space applications, particularly when cooled with backside illumination because they can then detect single photons of, of light, makes them extremely attractive for uh, astronomy. Whereas in, we all know about CC, CMOS images because that's what now used in our cameras. 1990s integrated circuit CMOS technology had enormously improved and a guy called Eric Fossum basically reintroduced the invention for Peter Noble and uh, these are manufacturable using standard CMOS fab technology. So you can take a fab line that makes microprocessors and you can make uh, images on that same line, which is, gives you a real cost advantage. Uh, CMOS is also lower power than CCDs. And today the, the, the technology just provides extraordinary uniformity, resolution and sensitivity. So CMOS has, has taken over from CCDs in, in photography. This is just a picture of a CMOS active pixel. Uh, it's a, a micro lens, it, it, one pixel. There are many, you know, millions of these on, on a chip. Um, in, there's a little lens that focuses the light down onto a photodiode. There's a color filter in there, red, green, blue, or whatever color system they use. There are additional transistors of maybe four or six transistors in each pixel now, because you can make tiny, tiny pixels. And so this is, this is one, one pixel. Uh, in some images, now they do away with this front surface illumination and etch the silicon thin and project the light onto the backside. I have a camera with backside illuminated um, CMOS. Just as a G whiz, today's silicon technology, for those who are not aware of it, this is an 18 inch single crystal silicon wafer. And this is what's, what's used in today's fabs. Uh, th this is why we have such cheap chips because they're made in such, such uh, quantities. Uh, the history of today's, today's CMOS technology is Interesting, um, 1967, a guy called Bob Kerwin invented self-aligned gate transistor at Bell Labs. I know Bob, he has a house here in Chatham. You can see him on Harding's Beach in the summer. 
1970s, CMOS was developed. Um, single crystal silicon, that, that wafer that we're seeing on the right-hand side is better than one part per billion pure. Wafers are 18 inch, I said that. The minimum design rule today is just unbelievable. When I started, it was, it was three microns. Um, now it's 10 nanometers, which is about five times 10 to the minus four mils in the amount that a mill is one thousandth of an inch. And that is about one three thousandth the width of a human hair. So, so these are extra extraordinarily fine. A microprocessor chip can have up to 18 billion transistors. Just amazing technology. Anyway, uh, CMOS Imager Sales, this gets you into the commercial side of the business. In 2015, there were about $10 billion worth of images manufactured. They predicted 15 billion in 2020. Uh, that was forecast, so I don't know what it really is. And you can see the, the, they're not making fewer phones, they're just making more chips for other applications, in particular automotive here. We all, all the new cars have um, cameras uh, for rear view and cameras for other things actually. So at that, I left imaging in the uh, 1970s. I, Bell Labs did not have a need. Western Electric did not have a need for images. So I decided I would do something else. So 1980, I developed a modem on a chip. And this was a first also. At that time, modems were very, very slow speed, but they also were about the size of a shoebox. So again, looking for small size, I decided to make a chip. And in fact, we made a two chip modem. Uh, this chip was my, particularly my chip. It had uh, mix analog digital on it. This was an all digital chip. And um, this was actually the first, this chip was the first mixed analog digital chip to be manufactured anywhere in the world. Today, Mixed analog digital chips are commonplace and they're manufactured in, in vast numbers for much of the equipment that we use, um, we buy and use. Um, 1985, I had another project to reduce the cost of analog digital chip used for every phone line. And I reduced that from $20 to $1 in all sorts of various ways. 1989, I developed the key analog interface chip for Nokia's first GSM mobile phone. That phone had five chips, four of them were digital, and, and this one was mixed analog digital. They were all made by uh, uh, Bell Lab, designed by Bell Labs in the end. 1989, I retired from Bell Labs. Out in 1991, 97, I was director of electron devices research for the US Army. I managed to hear about 70 PhDs and staff in three states, which is an interesting, uh, interesting job to see how the government and the military operate. I retired from that. And in 1998, I developed, started developing a comprehensive electronic medical record and practice management software for healthcare providers. This was a, a brochure, uh, that company still exists and uh, I've sold I've sold out of it but uh, it's still still going strong so that's those are some of the things I did after imaging I thought you'd be interested to hear about that I will briefly talk about this Nobel co controversy because that led actually to the various awards I got uh, in, in 19, in 29, one half of the Nobel Prize in physics was given to Boyle and Smith. And the citation was for the invention of an imaging semiconductor circuit, the CCD sensor. Now, Gene Gordon, who was my former Bell Labs director and also an inventor and so on. And, and this is what he wrote about this. The patent for the charge transfer imaging device to which the Nobel award actually applies was in the name of Thompson and not Smith and Boyle. Their patent had nothing to do with an imaging device. They never built an imaging device or any other device. Thompson built the device of this patent, a color TV camera, and it worked. 
Since both Smith and Thompson worked for me, I can say with great certainty that the award is a terrible injustice. The invention record is clear. How could the Nobel Award Committee mess up so badly? Well, it's happened before to other people. I, I, I was pretty uncertain um, that in fact, the Nobel Prize should even be award, awarded to an engineer. It's mostly for physics. But anyway, the interesting thing is that in, when Boyle died, the obituary in the New York Times also said, Boyle and Smith wouldn't know an imaging of a device if it stared them in the face. So I got mentioned in an obituary, which is kind of interesting. But what this controversy did for me was that it unearthed me as somebody who'd done something once upon a time, and all of a sudden, um, <laughs> the floodgates were opened for, uh, for awards. And I'm afraid I got quite a number of awards that, that, that followed on that. You can see in, in um, in, 20, in, 19, in 2010, I was awarded a national medal. And this from, um, actually that was Ob uh, President Obama, it's awarded in the White House which is it was quite a ceremony. That's 10 people that were there, uh, half were for the science medal and the other half for the engineering medal. And, but the interesting thing is that the citation here read for pioneering work in materials and electronics technologies. And I had done work already in materials, uh, inventing some stuff. And I haven't even mentioned that in, that, in this talk. That's a whole different, different uh, item. Uh, Kevin also mentioned the uh, um, Queen's Award, Queen Awards Prize, uh, Queen's Award Prize for Engineering, which was uh, given presented by Prince of Wales in Buckingham Palace, which was another pretty impressive event. And I'll show you a picture of this this uh, trophy. Uh, there's a story attached associated with that, but. Uh, Prince Charles is, is presenting that, that trophy. So other awards, I guess the 2012 uh, IEEE Edison Gold Medal, I value that because that was awarded by the, the Institute of Institution of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. Those are my peers, so they ought to know the, the merits of what I did. Um, I, I am a member of the National Academy of Engineering. That's a very prestigious award. Uh, just last year, um, well, the, the award was actually made last year, it should have been made uh, previously. Um, it was the 2019 National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences Technology and Engineering Emmy. That's a, quite a mouthful, but the, we, we're all very familiar with Emmys being awarded to, to uh, performers. But in fact, the, the Engineering Award, Engineering Emmy, was the first of any Emmy that was made about 1948. And the reason it's called an Emmy is because at that time, um, the Emmy was the nickname for the image orthicon. I mentioned that earlier. So the, they didn't like the name Emmy, so they adopted Emmy. So that's the story of that. Um, couple of awards here, Royal Photographic Society and the New Jersey Inventors Hall of Fame. Um, so that, that's what that, <laughs> that Nobel Prize unleashed. Um, well, I, the, this was the award for the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering. This, the, the QE Prize all, used to be awarded every two years. It's now being awarded annually. Uh, the, the, they also, award a prize for the person who innovates the best form of trophy. So every year there'll be a, a different trophy. This one was invented by a 16 year old high school boy from Wales. It's a very interesting design. He said it was inspired by the mountains of Wales. It's a very complicated design and it had to be uh, made, fabricated using uh, 3D printing. So software was written, the 3D printer made this item. Uh, the, here's, the, here's the Emmy, which you've all seen in um, 
<laughs> when they've been pre presented to performers. Uh, unfortunately, with COVID, this came through the mail. I did not have to go up on stage and, and jubilantly wave it. Well, the Daily Mail, went, when the Queen's Award was awarded, we were in London. Uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering arranged press interviews and J Daily Mail was there. And this is what they came out with from, their, from that press interview. All the, I said, all these selfies make me wish I never invented digital cameras. We were always running into people in London who would, would thrust their, their selfie stick in your face as you were walking down the pavement. And it was quite, uh, I, so I, I, I voiced that and disappeared in the national press in Britain. A full page. Uh, we're just about at the end of the talk now. Um, I think Kevin said they're 45 minute talks. I've got about four minutes left. Um, so it's pretty good timing actually. And then I'll show you some of my hardware. But before I do that, let me show you a video that if I can get it up, okay, uh, that appeared on BBC World News America, it appeared on PBS. Uh, whilst we're in London, I started getting emails saying, oh, we saw you on television. So this is it. Um, I have, whoops. Oh. Okay, now it'll work. There we go. The four inventors of the digital camera were awarded the highest international engineering award, the Queen Elizabeth Prize. Palab Ghosh has the story for us now. We've seen the beauty of distant planets, marveled at nature's intricacies, captured the wonders around us, and celebrated our most treasured moments in selfies. All these images have come from digital cameras, we snap them, upload them, and share them. They've transformed our view of the world around us. Engineering is a fun... Now, the engineers who invented digital cameras have been awarded the biggest prize in engineering. The digital camera was developed in the early 1970s by a British researcher, Dr. Mike Tomset. His camera next to him looks like a shoebox, rather than equipment that started a technological revolution. And this was the very first coloured digital picture of his wife, Margaret. Forty years on, with her husband and the camera he used, she remembers the moment. It was kind of fun. They just took the photo and it came out and it uh, was all pretty fuzzy compared with uh, uh, a regular film photo at that time. Well, the light comes in here. We have a light screen. And Dr. Tomset was surprised at how his invention caught on. Certainly we had no idea that these things would become as small and, and uh, ubiquitous as they have today. Digital cameras now fit into mobile phones because they were miniaturized by Professor Eric Fossum. I don't think I really had any idea of the impact it would have. I thought it would be useful for many things, but the impact is just amazing and just surprises me, astonishes me almost on a daily basis. Like it or not, the digital camera has changed our world, and the selfie is here to stay. Okay. All right, so that's the end of my uh, formal presentation. Uh, but I can show you the uh, the camera that I have here. You, you saw it in the video. Can everybody see that? Very cool. Oh, that okay. looks very, very cool. Well, thank you very much for showing us that and for your, your wonderful lecture. Um, I'm going to be asking some questions if people would like to pose any in the Q&A function you can find at the bottom of your screen. Um, but I'll start off with, um, I think one question that I have in terms of, um, you know, a, a lot of the work that goes on in, in technology and in engineering, um, I know that, you know, you're kind of developing things for the moment that you currently live in, but then with the acknowledgement that 
they will continue to be developed and continue to get smaller and become more efficient. Um, have things happened sort of along a timeline that you were expecting or um, has has technology developed even more quickly than you originally thought? Um, I know that, again, it hasn't been that long since that initial photograph was taken. Um, and now we we have these wonderful images, um, you know, on, on all of our cell phones. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit um, to that to get us started. And, and like I said, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. <laughs> has it developed as fast as you expected? Um, I didn't highlight in the talk that um, Peter Noble, when he gave his original presentation in 1967 and the press reported on it, he told the uh, reporter that they would have the bugs worked out in about a year to 18 months. Well, it took uh, another 30, 30 years before they had viable devices based on that technology. So that I knew that was going to happen fairly slowly because the technology was very rudimentary. And I happened to know about the quality that was required in, in imaging devices. I mean, the work that people went through to make camera tubes uh, in, in the 60s was, was pretty amazing. So I expected it to take a, take a, a long time. Uh, I'm not sure I expected it to get as good as it has today. I mean, it's, it's, it's extremely amazing. And the progress has, has kind of galloped along in, in this century that, uh, you know, the fine line technology and the perfection has, has uh, just gone on a pace. And uh, I don't know, as, as we said in the, as both the, uh, both of us said in the vis in the uh, in the video, uh, we <laughs> we we're quite surprised by by where it's all gone. And I think Kodak was quite surprised by by having to give up uh, celluloid film as well. Definitely a lot of yeah a lot of developments in that in that industry. Uh, we have one question about um, what phone do you use, Mike? Which which cell phone type do you do you use? Since you obviously are so connected with the um, the camera base of it. What? Well, I use an iPhone, but um, you know uh, the 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 quality of I think any of the more contemporary phones are, are far better than. The, the most of us need most of the time. Very true. Um, we have another question about, um, you had mentioned that the digital cameras were used in space missions in particular. Um, and somebody is asking about if you knew, if you knew what the first unclassified space mission um, that used the digital camera was. No, I don't, I have no idea. The, the only thing I, the, the only thing I have is I, I showed that picture and, and this is this is a, a, the type of device that went on Voyager. I don't think that was a class that wasn't a classified um, application. So this is pretty big. You can see from my hand and this is a 16 megapixel CCD and the charge would, would could be moved across the whole uh, area of this this device. And uh, the, the linear linear devices are up in the satellites. And I think that was a very early application that was probably almost certainly classified in the early days. Now, of course, we all see Google pictures, but line scan, linear scan devices, they stitch them together to make very long devices. And um, they, they must have been used for military applications, classified applications, very early on. We've got one question um, about your your former employer actually talking about um, Bell Labs and how it was um, such a, a sort of powerhouse throughout the 20th century, um, but asking about after it was sort of restructured, um, you know, how you think that it has had, if you think it has had a similar impact in the latter half of the 20th century as it did in sort of earlier parts. Uh, well, um, 
Bell Labs in, in its original, in the uh, form that it was when I joined it, uh, it, it all the operating companies, uh, phone companies around the country, uh, Western Electric for manufacturing and Bell Labs for R&D were all part of, of AT&T. And the money, that the, the revenue for Bell Labs was 1% of the value of the installed base of the phone system across the country. So that gave Bell Labs a fantastic uh, uh, income uh, to, to, to use. And so that's one thing. I mean, they, it was very, very well equipped and they could afford to do an awful lot of things. The other point is that they were very good at hiring people. And I have to say that 18, that Bell Labs went around the world and hired a, a lot of us from around the world, which didn't necessarily help the world, but it did help Bell Labs. Um, what's happened subsequently? Uh, you know, I was in the integrated circuit part of the business. Uh, they started what was called ATT Microelectronics. And so the design work that I did was to go into that, that entity for manufacture. But that got to the point where I had to do a, a discount cash flow analysis before I went to the uh, John. I mean, it was. Uh, it, the, the, the nature of the Bell Labs changed. A lot of people were let go, which actually it was, is very much to the benefit of the universities because they all found nice jobs in universities. And, and, and that's, that was quite a boost to universities around the country. Uh, they are still doing, doing good work, um, but a lot of it is in, in digital systems and, and digital coding and, and uh, so on. It, I, I'm, I don't think they do a lot of physical research anymore. Gotcha. Well, we have another question, um, sort of more on the technical side of things, um, that's asking about the filter that you mentioned that separates um, into primary colors. How does it then um, sense those primary colors and then recombine them back into an image that we would recognize? <laughs> Well, there's, there are different color systems. Uh, the first one was produced by a guy called Bayer from uh, um, Kodak. And it was just a red, green, blue uh, color system. There were twice as many green uh, elements as there were red and blue because our eyes are more sensitive, at least the high resolution part of our eyes are more sensitive to green. But there are other color systems, uh, cyan, well, the, um, cyan and, and something or other. So there are different color systems. They are, I mean, the, there's the, they are etched into a pattern on the device, the imaging device, the CMOS imager. <clears throat> and then they are reconstructed in appropriate ways uh, with the digital signal processor in the um, phone or, or camera. I can't give you the theory of how all that's done, but it is. Well, great. Um, unless we have any other questions, um, that is it for the ones that people have sent in. Um, so thank you very much, Mike. That was very, very interesting and informative um, and also exciting to hear that there are so many fascinating people who live in chat. I'm <laughs> glad to know we're, we're a community of, of uh, Retired engineers. It's a great thing. Great thing to have in town. Oh, you have a few of them tuned into this uh, broadcast. Oh, great. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mike. We uh, really appreciate you joining us this evening and uh, um, and uh, we we'll look forward to uh, your next invention. So and thank you, everybody, for coming on board to our Tuesday talks. And we look forward to seeing you in future talks. Everybody have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. You're very welcome.